So in the six weeks since Russia invaded Ukraine, the world has witnessed photos and videos of shocking atrocities. There have been calls to prosecute Russian President Vladimir Putin for war crimes before the International Criminal Court. Good afternoon, everybody from Cleveland, Ohio. I'm Michael Scharf. I'm Dean of Case Western Reserve University School of Law. It is my great pleasure to moderate this timely online roundtable discussion of Russian war crimes in the Ukraine. I understand that we have 176 attendees. We're going to start out with roundtable questions to our expert panelists, then it open it up for questions from you that you can send in through the chat function and my colleague Eric Seiler will be reading them. And uh, then at the end, we will announce the CLE um, code so that those of you who want CLE credit can get it. Let me begin by introducing our expert panelists. Joining us from Bangladesh is Milena Stereo. She's a professor of law at Cleveland Marshall College of Law. She's managing director of the Public International Law and Policy Group. And she has been part of an initiative to document war crimes in the Ukraine. That is not what she's doing in the Bangladesh, however. Um, real quickly, Milena, what are you doing at Cox Bazaar? Hello, Michael. Hello from Cox's Bazaar, Bangladesh. I hope you can hear me well. The internet here is a little bit spotty. Um, as some of our listeners may know, there is a very large Rohingya refugee camp located not too far from Cox's Bazaar, Bangladesh. Over a million re Rohingya refugees live in this camp. I'm here on behalf of the Public International Law and Policy Group as we have a large human rights documentation project in the camps working with the Rohingya ref refugees to document some of the atrocities, human rights violations that they had suffered at the hands of the Myanmar, at the hands of the Myanmar um, government and army. So when we're asking our experts about the ins and outs of documentation, nobody knows that better um, than Milena Stereo. Now, joining us from North Carolina is David Crane. David is the former chief prosecutor of the special court for Sierra Leone. He um, has led a group that has prepared a draft indictment of President Putin and other high-ranking Russians for the atrocities in the Ukraine. This draft indictment is, everybody's talking about it, and there's been a couple of other um, NGOs and organizations that have tried to emulate it as well. So we are looking forward to talking with David about the ins and outs of the draft indictment. And finally, joining us from Ontario, Canada, is Valerie Osterveld. She's a professor of law and associate director of the Center for Transnational Justice and Post-Conflict Reconstruction at Western Law in Canada. She was formerly attorney advisor in Canada's Department of Foreign Affairs, and she was a delegate to the Rome Diplomatic Conference that established the International Criminal Court. So when we have questions about the International Criminal Court, she's our go-to expert for that. My own background, as many of you know, is I was attorney advisor for UN Affairs at the State Department. I helped create the Yugoslavia Tribunal. I, through Public International Law and Policy Group, have been advising and working with all the tribunals, including a stint that I took during a sabbatical where I was special assistant to the prosecutor of the Cambodia Tribunal. And just uh, about six weeks ago, Milena Stereo and I were in The Hague um, we argued a case before the appeals chamber of the International Criminal Court. So uh, to some extent, I'll be chiming in um, probably during the Q&A with questions and answers as well. Now, let's kick things off. To set the stage for our conversation, I'd like to begin with Milena Stereo, back in Cox's Bazaar. Milena, can you tell us what evidence of war crimes and crimes against humanity we are seeing in the Ukraine? Michael, as of now, we have seen pretty significant evidence of both war crimes and crimes against humanity, but let me just take 30 seconds and explain to our audience what we're really talking about in terms of the two different categories of crimes. 
War crimes are serious violations of fundamental rules of international humanitarian law, such as, for example, intentionally targeting civilians or civilian objectives, using prohibited weapons, such as poisonous gases or landmines, or causing harm which is disproportionate to the military objective sought. Crimes against humanity, on the other hand, are violations committed systematically on a widespread scale against civilians. Now, you might have some of the same underlying acts that actually give rise to both war crimes and crimes against humanity. In the context of Ukraine, we have thus far seen evidence of intentional targeting, intentional shelling of civilians, of civilian buildings, civilian objectives, summary executions, rape, um, pretty horrific um, evidence of pre pretty horrific acts that can give rise to both war crimes. And then if we have evidence that this is committed on a widespread and systematic scale, some of the same underlying acts can also give rise to crimes against humanity. All right, let me turn to Valerie. Uh, numerous commentators, including UN officials, have indicated that Russian troops are not complying with international humanitarian law. That's the laws of war. Some have said that Russia has, quote, thrown away the rule book. Valerie, why do you think that this war is being fought in such a brutal fashion? Michael, I don't know what is in the minds of President Putin and his commanders, but what I can say is that similarly brutal forms of warfare have been used by Russia in the past. So for example, it was Russian standard practice in Syria to attack civilians, including medical personnel and journalists and civilian objects like hospitals. And Russian military strategists have described this form of warfare as pursuing massive devastation, including fatalities among the civilian population in order to limit one's own casualties. This form of warfare dates back to the conflict in Chechnya where Russian air troops turn cities into rubble. And of course we can see that today in Mariupol and its ground troops massacred civilians in what was widely understood to be a deliberate campaign to terrorize the population into submission. And we can also see this in Ukraine. The second Chechen war was when President Putin came to power and he has espoused similar approaches to warfare ever since. I, I think that actually explains a lot for us. Let me turn back to Milena. We've already talked about the fact that she's leading an effort uh, organized by PILPG to interview witnesses in the Ukraine via Zoom. Melena, can you tell us about that initiative? How, how is that working? How is that set up? What, what are the, the goals of that? Sure. So through the Public International Law and Policy Group, just this week, we launched the Ukraine Accountability Initiative through which we plan to interview and collect testimony from at least a thousand Ukrainian witnesses and victims over the following several months. The testimony will be collected over Zoom through the help of interpreters if, if that is necessary. And by the way, Michael, there will also be an on the ground component, component to this. So we will have a PLPG team of investigators that will actually travel to Poland to actually do a part of this work um, in person. The ultimate goal in many of these documentation initiatives is accountability. Um, by the way, the testimony, once it's collected, will be coded and will then be preserved in an electronic database. We have built a database where we can store all of, the, um, all of the testimony, all of the information. Down the line, we hope to transfer this information to either the ICC or another international or domestic accountability mechanism. I know later in this discussion, we'll, we'll get to that. So I don't want to uh, jump ahead and talk about that yet, but ultimately we hope that this will serve the accountability goal and that the information will be transferred to one of the tribunals prosecuting Russian leaders. And you're not the only ones doing this. Um, so we have major countries like the United States, Canada, the United Kingdom that have been involved in uh, um, collecting and collating evidence of war crimes. We've got satellite images, physical evidence, tape recordings of intercepts of phone calls, I guess, by military members of Russia that have been intercepted and are saying that they are committing war crimes right there on the, the audio. Um, and then you've got the International Bar Association's 
uh, app that they have um, supplied all over the Ukraine so that when people are on their iPhones and they, they get videotape of atrocities, they can push a button, it uploads to the cloud, and it has metadata that is attached to it so that it is self-authenticating in a court of law, which means it can be used without somebody having to come in and say, I took that video. So all this stuff is coming in. It's a mountain of evidence coming in. Who's going to sift through all of that? Yeah, that, that's a great question, Michael. So you're absolutely right. There might be a lot of evidence collected. Ultimately, though, it will be up to every accountability mechanism seeking to prosecute to actually sort of reinvestigate and double check the evidence. So as, as you know, for example, the International Criminal Court can receive evidence. So an individual or a group can send evidence to the ICC. However, the ICC has to independently verify that evidence. So the ICC has, has to actually use its own investigators to double check to verify. And so ultimately will be up to every different accountability mechanism to receive the evidence, sift through, and also then independently double check and verify the accuracy and authenticity of that evidence. You know, Melina, when we were at breakfast during the American Society of International Law with Fatou Bensouda, the former prosecutor of the ICC, uh, we talked about this challenge that she had faced with respect to Darfur. There were so many people sending her so much about the, the genocide and the atrocities in Darfur. And what she said is that countries seconded, which means loaned, a bunch of investigators and prosecutors, and they then helped the court sift through the information. So I assume that the ICC would be prepared to accept that kind of um, assistance, not just you know having this evidence dumped on them, but people that can help them sort through it. Now, yeah, definitely. And Michael, by the way, just to, just to add this, um, Fatu also, Fatu Bezuda also mentioned that sometimes the evidence collected by a group or by, by an individual can lead the ICC to discover the smoking gun evidence, yeah, right? So yeah. sometimes the evidence received might not be sort of the best evidence, but it might lead the court to the discovery of, you know, sort of the best evidence that they need in order to successfully prosecute someone. All right, so now a drum roll, because we're going to turn to David Crane, our chief prosecutor. Uh, Dave, your team has drafted an indictment of President Putin and other Russian officials to be used as a template for the International Criminal Court or other courts. Tell us about this initiative. Well, thank you, Michael and uh, my colleagues. It's great to be with you again, and good afternoon. Uh, we recently published a white paper on Russian war crimes, uh, which told about the background uh, uh, of all of it uh, and laid out a case. Uh, but in our appendix, a did draft uh, a indictment against Vladimir Putin uh, to show the world that when it can be done, we've already done this before with, uh, with President Charles Taylor of Liberia and, and being the person who uh, investigated, uh, drafted the indictment uh, and issued the indictment, which took him down ultimately uh, I used uh, the same format as we did with uh, a previous head of state, committing very similar crimes, war crimes and crimes against humanity. But we also added the uh, crime of aggression. Now, this is a generic uh, indictment, uh, but uh, all, of the, all of the charges uh, that are in that indictment are actually provable in court. Uh, we use the same standard as we used when we took down President Charles Taylor. So all of the, you know, the indictment itself could technically be brought forth uh, before the ICC and or a, another justice mechanism, because I think it's really important uh, that uh, your uh, listeners understand uh, that uh, we have a bit of a jurisdictional issue. The uh, International Criminal Court uh, can deal with uh, 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 war crimes, crimes against humanity, and even potentially uh, rumblings of incitement to genocide. Whereas uh, the crime of aggression, which is the uh, international crime that has really kind of created uh, this situation, uh, will have to be dealt with by another justice mechanism. Uh, I've been kind of pushing gently uh, for a special court for Ukraine, uh, the world's second hybrid international war crimes tribunal. I helped create the first one in Sierra Leone and uh, to be able to deal with the crime of aggression uh, in the hopes that, and I think this could probably happen in the General Assembly authorizing the Secretary General uh, 
to go and enter into negotiations with the Republic of the Ukraine to create this, this special court for, uh, for uh, uh, Ukraine to deal with the, the crime of aggression. But the indictment itself has the crime of aggression in there as well, because we haven't actually charged aggression since, for all intents and purposes, Nuremberg, and it was a crime against peace. So it was a very interesting moment for all of us as we were beginning to draft this. It was almost like a, in the modern era, the first time that we were professionally putting together the crime of aggression. So it was an interesting, uh, it was an interesting to do that. But again, it just shows that uh, the international community uh, and practitioners and academics that uh, we have the this experience, we have the jurisprudence, and we have the proper rules of procedure and evidence to prosecute those who bear the greatest responsibility for the invasion of the Ukraine and the subsequent international crimes that they have committed. And it's not just Vladimir Putin, it's really important also to understand within that white paper that we published, we also in Appendix D list uh, uh, the most responsible parties uh, that could also and probably will be uh, indicted for war crimes. David, let, let me ask you. Let me ask you about that. So I have that indictment in front of me. Um, the people, in addition to President Putin, that you include are the chief of the general staff, the second in command of the general staff, the director of military intelligence, the commander of the Russian ground forces, um, the secretary of Russia's security council. But not included on that list is the Russian foreign minister Sergei uh, um, Lerov. Uh, right. Yeah, why not? Should he be included? You know, at Nuremberg, they did include the foreign minister of uh, Germany. Yeah, we took a look at him. Uh, and it's, you know, uh, we, at this point in time, we did not have enough evidence to show that he is uh, bearing the greatest responsibility for these crimes. Yes, he is representing the Russian Federation that is committing these crimes. Uh, if we run into uh, evidence to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he is also directly linked to this that we would. But again, these are, these are crimes of conflict, uh, of aggression. Uh, and so we have a chain of command under the command responsibility rules. Uh, he, uh, Vladimir Putin is the commander in chief by their constitution of their armed forces. So he is individually criminally responsible for all of the acts of his armed forces. And then of course, all of his national security and chain of command structure within the armed forces of the Russian Federation are clearly within that link, which we can link uh, uh, charge based on command responsibility. Uh, but you know, Lavrov. Oh, and, and I want Lavrov to stop you again. Home. So you, you mentioned command responsibility, and that is a, a legal theory that the International Criminal Court and other international tribunals apply that says that a commander is responsible for what they order, but also for things that their subordinates commit that are atrocities that the commander should have known uh, were likely to um, be committed and they didn't take action either to um, prevent them or to punish them. Uh, that's only one theory of liability. What are some of the other theories of liability that you know, might apply to Putin and these other commanders? Well, certainly another one and one that we, uh, of course we charged President Charles Taylor with command responsibility as well. And he was ultimately on the, uh, the theory of liability of aiding and abetting. Uh, uh, which that would also be a, an appropriate theory that if I was prosecuting uh, those who bear the greatest responsibility for the invasion of Ukraine, we would also use that theory of, of liability to in fact uh, uh, you know, take them down. And then of course, you also have another theory of liability, which is direct responsibility. But in, at, at this point in time, uh, you know, I think the more viable theories are uh, 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 command responsibility uh, and aiding and abetting, which uh, are very viable and are within the indictment the, that we drafted. The favorite uh, theory of liability at the Yugoslavia Tribunal was something called joint criminal enterprise liability. I want to turn right. to Valerie Osterveld, our expert at the ICC, and ask her, does the ICC have that kind of liability? Yes, it does, Michael, but it's in a slightly different form. So apart from directly ordering, soliciting, or inducing the commission of crimes or aiding and abetting, there's also one that allows for an individual to be charged for contributing to the commission of crimes by a group acting with a common purpose. So it's slightly different. Um, it's in Article 25 of the Rome Statute, if anyone in the audience wants to look it up. 
But this common purpose approach can also be one that could be used to go after President Putin and other leaders within Russia. And, and I want to be clear here, we're not talking about prosecuting, you know, Private Ryan um, or, you know, the colonels uh, or the captains or the lieutenants. We're really talking today about focusing on the general staff and the presidency. Um, and again, David, why is it so important that it be those that you say are most responsible or have the highest levels of responsibility? Well, again, I think it's, it's, it, there's several reasons, one of which is a practical approach. Uh, you know, we found that uh, the mandate that we had at the International Tribunal in Sierra Leone was greatest responsibility. And it was a, it was a practical way of charging those who uh, cooked off, created the conditions of that horror story that took place in West Africa. Uh, and it's, it's the most efficient and effective way of accountability that doesn't absolve uh, the captains, the sergeants, the privates, uh, that's going to be taken care of as well. We have a very vigorous uh, uh, prosecutor general in Ukraine. Uh, she has crimes being committed on her territory and has the ability to prosecute them uh, if they, uh, they're in her custody. Uh, but at the international level, we have to, uh, we have to go, over, uh, go after those who really do bear the greatest responsibility because it's the more efficient, effective uh, uh, way to, to for accountability. We can't prosecute everybody or more importantly, every act that takes place. We have to, and you'll see this in the indictment, it's representational charging. We pick the crimes that are, uh, that capture the gravamen of the crime, rape or pillage or plunder or whatever the issue may be, abduction, whatever, so that the indictments are quite short, but it does capture the gravamen of what Putin and his commanders have done, the senior commanders uh, have done uh, to, to the Ukraine. But that doesn't mean that the lower ranks will not be uh, out of criminal liability. It's just that it'll be just a different jurisdiction to include uh, other nations from the European Union. We have Germany very much involved in that. We have the, some of the Scandinavian countries are also building cases against individuals who they feel uh, have committed uh, violations of their own domestic law as well. Now, Melena gave us a definition of genocide, and you mentioned genocide as well, but that is currently not in your draft indictment, uh, which was drafted several weeks ago, but things have changed. Do you think that the recent developments regarding the annihilation of Mariupol, the ethnic cleansing at the Donbass region, some of the, the horrible things we're hearing that are mass civilian casualties, does that raise the possibility of a genocide charge in your mind? You know, it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, this, you know, the indictments are living and breathing documents and they can be amended and adjusted depending on how the facts shake out. Uh, at the time when we were doing this, uh, uh, we did not have clear evidence uh, of a genocide. I still don't think we do. It's a very specific intent crime. As uh, Melania said, you, know, you, have, you do have to have a smoking gun. We have to have a mm -hmm. specific intent by Vladimir Putin and his commanders to destroy in whole or in part uh, a peoples, which is the Ukrainians. Now, I think we have a stronger case now, and a lot of people tend to forget we can, we, I think we're getting closer to incitement to genocide, which is part of the, uh, the genocide convention. And I think that uh, that's becoming more chargeable. But again, it's a genocide rolls easily off the tongue, but it's very difficult, take it from uh, uh, international prosecutors, very difficult to actually prove uh, genocide. Another important point, real quickly, does it matter? We have war crimes, crimes against humanity. Mm -hmm. uh, they're destroying uh, uh, Ukrainians and, their, and civilian uh, uh, targets, what have you. Uh, it, we have to be very, very careful. Politicians and diplomats tend to, to rank the various international crimes. There's genocide, then there's crimes against humanity, then there's war crimes. And I've even heard uh, diplomats say, well, it's, it's not a genocide, it's only a crime against humanity. And I, I push right back. Uh, and say, wait a minute, that's not, you know, it doesn't matter because, you know, 30, you know, 5,000 people killed by a crime against humanity are, are just as dead and still need justice. So we have to be very careful how we use our terms, how we use it. I think uh, we are getting evidence potentially for an incitement to genocide, but I don't think we're quite there to just charge him with, with, the, with clear genocide. It's just not quite there yet. But again, you know, we're still investigating, still turning over the rocks and seeing what happens. But I got to be able to have something that says Vladimir Putin directed 
the destruction in whole or in part, uh, the, uh, the, you know, the people of Ukraine and the Ukrainian Republic. So but, we have to But I suppose, that. Dave, if um, his goal in the Donbass region, this is the eastern region of the Ukraine that goes from the northeast through Mariupol, which is the land bridge, all the way down to Crimea, his goal is, is literally to get rid of all the Ukrainian speaking um, people from that area and have only Russian speaking people who he considers loyal. Would, would that, let me ask Milena, would that be a form of genocide if he accomplishes that? Milena, are you still there from uh, Bangladesh? I'll, I'll switch over to Valerie. Sure, and then if you don't mind, Michael, I'll link it to some evidence that we have right now. So if that was able to be proven, then we would have potentially the intent to destroy in whole or in part a particular group. Um, as David said, right now, there's not super clear evidence to demonstrate that intent. And don't forget that there are two different types of evidence that need to be brought before a court in any case, whether it's genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity. Um, there's the crime base, and then there's the linkage evidence. So we have some evidence in the crime base that potentially this is the case, but this needs to be then linked up the chain of command and we need to have proof beyond a reasonable doubt of that intent to destroy from the top to the bottom and the bottom to the top. And it's, it's the, the middle part where we're having some difficulties with the evidence. But let me link this to some evidence that came out. In recent weeks from Bucha, the Ombudsperson for Human Rights of Ukraine had brought forward evidence after the Russian troops had left the area north of Kyiv that in Bucha there were 25, about 25 women and girls who were held in a basement by occupying Russian, occupying Russian troops and that they had held those women and girls for systematic rape and other forms of sexual violence. Mm -hmm. And as they were committing that rape, they were telling the girls and women that the reason why they were doing this is in order to uh, prevent them from having Ukrainian children and also to get them to a point where they would never want to have sexual contact with any man in the future. And nine of them are now pregnant. It's this kind of evidence of the crime base that points somewhat in the direction of genocide as well, of course, as crimes against humanity and war crimes, and could be used if there were, uh, if there was a genocide char charge that was brought. Um, and if, if you don't mind, Michael, would you mind, would it be okay if I talked a little bit more about the sexual and gender-based violence that's happening? I, I, you are the world's expert at that. I would love it if you would. All right. Um, when Russia invaded Ukraine, I was worried from the very start about sexual and gender-based violence taking place in addition to the war crimes, such as intentional um, direct attacks against civilians and civilian objects and indiscriminate attacks that we were hearing about every day in the news. And this is because, first and foremost, I've worked on sexual and gender-based violence in conflict for over 20 years. And in my experience, there has never been a conflict that I've studied that has not had sexual and gender-based violence. And secondly, occupation by Russian troops of Ukrainian towns when those, those Russian troops didn't have a very clear reason to be there creates exactly the type of context which is ripe for sexual violence in particular. C civilians in very vulnerable circumstances under the control of a military that has been told that Ukrainian national identity is not genuine, but yet they, they didn't know exactly, um, they weren't welcomed as liberators as they, had told, they were told they were going to be, and they didn't quite know what exactly they were doing there. And then there have been reports of sexual and gender-based violence, including sexualized torture committed by Russian-supported fighters in the Donbass region since 2014. So it's not surprising that in recent weeks, we have heard more and more and more about sexual and gender-based violence in Ukraine, unfortunately. So the things that are going on there are absolutely horrible. Um, let's go back to focusing on uh, President Putin. Uh, David, wouldn't President Putin have head of state immunity 
Can you tell us about the case you tried against Charles Taylor, the president of Liberia before the special court for Sierra Leone and how that is relevant to that question? Well, it's very relevant. And uh, from uh, prosecutor versus Charles Ganke Taylor, president of the Republic of Liberia, uh, uh, we had a very important uh, ruling by our appellate chamber, uh, which is a cornerstone for further jurisprudence that says that if a head of state, while he is the head of state, uh, commits international crimes, they are not immune under the head of state immunity principle, which is a centuries old uh, principle under international law that has never been even questioned or chipped away at until prosecutor versus Taylor. And so uh, they found that uh, Charles Taylor is not immune from uh, his, his international crimes and war crimes and crimes against humanity. And based on that, we were able to proceed forward with, uh, with a successful prosecution of uh, the first sitting head of state in the modern era for, uh, for war crimes and crimes against humanity. And that's why I keep reminding uh, uh, carefully and specifically the international community is that we've done this before, we can do this again, and that we should continue to step forward because my concern is we've got strong men around the world watching like crocodiles uh, what we do with Vladimir Putin. If we do nothing or do something that's a half measure, uh, then we're going to see some really challenging times with China, North Korea, uh, other, other strong men around the world who say, wow, maybe perhaps I can get away with this and not be held accountable. I don't think that will happen. I think Vladimir Putin will be indicted for war crimes and crimes against humanity. If there's another jurisdiction uh, to be able to prosecute him for aggression, they'll do that as well. But I think that he is, he is now uh, heading down a path towards a, an appropriate uh, indictment against him. Well, and David, your president um, led the International Criminal Court to build upon that in the case of al-Bashir, the president of the Sudan, who was indicted for genocide in Darfur. And the appeals chamber there said that there is no head of state immunity before the International Criminal Court. Uh, now, in part, your tribunal, the Special Court for Sierra Leone, wrestled with how international it was, recognizing that you had to be a truly international court for there not to be head of state immunity. And, and they decided they were international enough. Let me ask Melena a question. If the General Assembly were to create this other tribunal to prosecute the crime of aggression, which David told us earlier cannot be prosecuted by the ICC, um, would that be international enough under this precedent, such that Putin wouldn't have head of state immunity? And, and what would happen if the General Assembly had a close vote so it only passed by a couple of votes. How international does the creation of the court have to be? Are you, uh, looks like Milena dropped out again. I smiled when she arrived back, but she's dropped out. Luckily, I know Valerie knows this issue as well. Can, can you? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, yes, the UN General Assembly could certainly um, be involved in the creation of a tribunal to um, prosecute aggression in committed in Ukraine, and it would need to do so at the request of Ukraine, which would prompt the adoption of a UN General Assembly resolution recommending the creation of such a tribunal. And then Ukraine and UN headquarters would come to an agreement on the specifics of that tribunal. And like David, I would recommend that it look like the Special Court for Sierra Leone, a freestanding international criminal tribunal, um, because that could take away the, the, any concerns about where the, the line is drawn between uh, a, a tribunal that is more an extension of the Ukrainian court system, as opposed to a, a freestanding international criminal tribunal that doesn't have to wrestle with this issue of head of state immunity. Um, you asked also about what would happen if the UN General Assembly vote was very close. Yeah, close. I would, yeah, I wouldn't predict that it would be very close at this moment in time, given the votes that we have seen in, since the start of the current U, uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, if it was along those lines, then I don't think we would have a problem. If it is very close, then that could create a problem in terms of how much the UN headquarters feels it has a mandate to come to an agreement on the specifics 
to create that freestanding international criminal tribunal. But from what we've seen so far on the political will amongst states that are willing to support such an idea or um, to prosecute aggression, I think that we would be more likely to end up with a better UN General Assembly outcome than, you're, than you uh, mentioned. One of the things I'm finding very fascinating is that there is a power shift occurring in real time between the Security Council and the General Assembly. The Security Council paralysis because of the Russian veto has caused the General Assembly to really act bolder than it has in years. So the first resolution it did to condemn Russia, it acted using its uh, famous uniting for peace authority. Uh, first time in years that it's used that. And um, more recently, there was a resolution passed just this week that said, whenever the Security Council is paralyzed by the veto, the General Assembly will have a debate to require an explanation of that veto. You know, so this is really bold and unusual new developments going on. Um, and I could definitely see one of those developments being the General Assembly's creation of this specialized court for the crime of aggression. Um, now, big picture here. Let me ask David, um, you, Valerie, and if Milena shows back up, we'll get back to her. Is there any real prospect that President Putin is going to be apprehended and turned over to an international court? I mean, there is no international constabulary. There's no James Bond that's going to jump into the Kremlin and kidnap him. What is the likelihood that this is more than just an academic exercise? Dave, do you want to jump in? Well, you know, we have to go back to uh, just recent history. Uh, you know, uh, Charles Taylor never thought he'd ever be held accountable for uh, war crimes and crimes against humanity and was held uh, responsible for the aiding and abetting of the destruction of over 1.2 million human beings. Uh, but, uh, but he did. And it took a couple of years for that to happen. But the international community, after he was indicted and put in house arrest in Calabar, Nigeria, he was handed over. And it was a political decision. And there will be a political decision or a circumstance perhaps someday next year, five years, 10 years, that uh, Vladimir Putin, an indicted war criminal, would be handed over to an appropriate jurisdiction for a fair and open trial. And that could be the International Criminal Court, this potential new justice mechanism, or even uh, the, uh, the Ukrainian court system uh, to, be, to be tried fairly uh, and openly. But again, uh, you know, it's going to be, uh, it's, it's a possibility. But it doesn't mean that we don't do these things, because, again, uh, there's no statute of limitations for international crimes. So it's very imperative that we do indict him and we don't have to have him sitting in court when we do indict him. Uh, and once he's indicted, uh, he is a pariah. He cannot leave uh, Russia. Uh, he has this ash mark on his forehead forever. Uh, and he his standing completely goes away, just like with Charles Taylor and Milosevic and others. Uh, that they, you know, they have no credibility anymore, and they're basically, you know, ignored by uh, the rest of the world. Other than this crazy notion that this crazy guy has his finger on the nuclear button, which I've been asked many times, and, I, and my 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 pointing out is we should ignore the nuclear button. We cannot uh, step away from countries that have nuclear abilities and not hold them for accountable for international crimes. We should continue to move forward. Uh, but again, it's a possibility. It could happen. It happened to Charles Taylor uh, and it could happen to him, but it doesn't matter. We have to indict him for these international crimes. And then we, the, politically, someday there'll be an opportunity for him to be uh, dealt with fairly and openly in a court of law. And Valerie, let me ask you the question of the linkage or the relationship between an indictment and the continuation of sanctions on Russia. Um, is there a relationship there, a positive relationship? There very well could be. The fact that, as David mentioned, an arrest warrant doesn't expire is incredibly important in this case, because we don't know what the future is going to be of Putin in Russia. Um, we don't know when that could change. And we saw the same with um, President al-Bashir in uh, Sudan with the indictment by the International Criminal Court, the arrest warrant by the International Criminal Court. At the time it was issued, many people said there's no chance that, that he'll ever get before the ICC. Now he's not before the ICC yet, 
but he also isn't president anymore. He doesn't have um, power anymore and he is in jail and could be put before the ICC because that arrest warrant never expires. Because it doesn't expire, it also could inspire the continuation of sanctions for quite some time to come. Well, let's look at the other side of that coin. Um, and, and I'll start with you, Valerie. Won't indicting Putin only prolong the conflict and make a peace agreement at the end more difficult to achieve? Well, I think the first point that I'd like to make is we don't have any indication so far, Michael, that President Putin is even willing to make a peace agreement. That's Everything true. we've seen in the negotiations so far is saying one thing and doing another. Um, and it's not surprising that Ukraine is um, not trusting the Russian delegation when they appear in these peace agreement negotiations. So I think that's the first point. Secondly, if anything, I think an arrest warrant would provide exactly <clears throat> the type of pressure needed to weaken his hold on power and drive a wedge between him and other leaders within his circle in Russia. David, do you wanna chime in? Well, yes, uh, I, I agree fully with, uh, with Valerie, but I mean, it gives his, uh, those who are starting to second guess him I think the political cover to say, well, he's now an indicted war criminal or soon to be indicted war criminal. And, uh, you know, we cannot have a head of state who is an indicted war criminal in the Russian Federation. And it gives them an ability to uh, both legally within the Russian, uh, under Russian domestic law, but also politically to develop a cornerstone by which they could remove him and hand him over at a future date. So, yeah, I think I think we shouldn't shy away from uh, from this and we should continue to move forward. And I think I'll oh, go ahead. Right. I was just going to say to link that back again to your point about sanctions, because the longer sanctions continue and the and the wider they become and the more affected the Russian economy becomes, there may be a breaking point between those who rely upon Putin's largesse in uh, lining their own pockets. And when those pockets start to empty, there may be a turning on him. We don't know. Exactly. Yes. You know, it's, uh, if I could just step in real quickly, you know, it's going to be a political decision when they hand him over. It's not a legal decision. Uh, it never is. It's we have to understand this. There will be a political moment in Russia that that could happen. You know, dictators don't have a very bright future. They don't retire comfortably in a dasha somewhere. You know, he doesn't have a bright future ahead of him. Uh, it's either he's going to die naturally or unnaturally, or he's going to be handed over to a court. Those aren't great odds. So let me uh, end our questioning before opening it to the audience with a question for the two of you. And that is, how do you think the international community's response to the Ukraine conflict will affect the future of international criminal justice? You wanna start, Valerie? Sure, I think that one of the most important things that we have to get right as an international community and within Ukraine is the cooperation that um, needs to happen in order to draw together all of the different justice mechanisms that have been started. So we have, as David mentioned, the prosecutor general in Ukraine in a joint investigation team with Poland and Lithuania collecting evidence of war crimes and crimes against humanity and, and potentially genocide. In Ukraine, we have now I think it's over 10 countries in the world that are already also themselves collecting evidence under universal jurisdiction of these sorts of crimes in Ukraine. And we have the International Criminal Court as well. We have the um, Commission of Inquiry created by the UN Human Rights Council and so on. But all of these, as David pointed out in an editorial yesterday, need to collabor collaborate and cooperate together. And if that can happen, that can create a really wonderful type of precedent for future um, conflicts and future situations where there can be similarly multi-layered responses, justice responses, accountability responses in many different ways. David, let me ask, um, are you a little bit concerned that creating an ad hoc tribunal for aggression would undermine the idea that the ICC is the one world's international criminal court now and we should only have one tribunal? 
Well, you know, that would be a knee jerk reaction of perhaps yes, but in reality, I think it would be a, uh, they would work together collaboratively, side by side, uh, sharing evidence, sharing investigations, sharing uh, anything that goes along with these international criminal investigations. Uh, and they would uh, just only split apart to uh, prosecute their, their separate uh, jurisdictional uh, crimes. But uh, no, I, I don't foresee that would weaken at all. In fact, I would think it would bolster the idea because the point here is about accountability for victims of atrocities. It's not about uh, the, the courts themselves. They are mechanisms by which that allows to happen. I think we're at a great moment here. I mean, uh, when Russia invaded Ukraine, everybody turned around saying, who's gonna take care of this? And by golly, we were ready. The modern international criminal law has developed to the point now where we can do this, we can do it effectively, efficiently, with a lot of experience and good jurisprudence to show that the rule of law is more powerful than the rule of the gun. So it's a, an important time uh, for, uh, for modern international criminal law, which kind of went nascent for a while over these past couple of years during what I call the age of the strong men, where the world kind of stepped away from international accountability. Now, everybody is saying, we need it, we have to have it. So this is our moment. And I think we'll be able to step up and, uh, and show the world that uh, you know, we just can't let people get away with these kind of crimes. So we have about 12 minutes left. Eric Seiler, can you um, read the questions that are coming in from the group and everybody out there, start typing. We're ready for your questions. We wanna hear what's on your mind. Our first, our first question is, what, account, what accountability agencies are there other than the ICC to hear these matters? Valerie? Sure, so there are a number of mechanisms that are already in motion um, to hear war crimes, crimes against humanity, um, potentially genocide charges. And those would be first and foremost, the work that's being done by the prosecutor general in Ukraine in collaboration with Poland and Lithuania in its joint, joint investigation team. And then a number of other countries in Europe, uh, Canada included looking under universal jurisdiction to investigate these crimes. And this discussion about having another mechanism that could complement the, the uh, other to try, gen to try aggression, which can't be tried before the International Criminal Court because of the way the jurisdiction is set up for that crime or to maybe uh, go after mid-level uh, ranking officials or, or something to somehow complement what all of these things that are going on. I just wanted to also say that the prosecutor of the ICC is well aware of the need to cooperate and collaborate and plan um, all of these accountability mechanisms so they can work together. And just recently announced that he is partnering um, or is in a partnership with the joint investigation team um, in Ukraine in order to ensure that they're not doing overlapping work, that they're not replicating each other's work and that they can make a good plan to, to figure out who's going to do what. It's good to hear. Eric, do you wanna ask another question from the audience? Our next question is, what type of power or authority does the ICC have to actually bring those responsible to justice? For example, how are they brought into the form to be tried? David, you want to tackle that? Well, well you know, there's, there's, there, there's, there, there, they have rules of procedure uh, that allow once they are finished with and are looking at an indictment, once they have that issued in an arrest warrant, uh, then they stand by until that individual is handed over. Once the individual is handed over, uh, then they start going through really very similar to what you would see even in the state of Ohio. You start seeing, you know, arraignment, you start seeing pretrial uh, uh, issues being dealt with, et cetera, et cetera. So that uh, once he gets into the system, uh, it's a pretty straightforward process uh, moving towards trial uh, and, and appeal. Uh, but there are, you know, set rules of procedure uh, uh, that the International Criminal Court uh, follows for any uh, defendant, but the you know the, the key is is that you know uh, the rights of the defendant are scrupulously honored to ensure that the people understand that this is a free, fair, and open trial, which is, I think is important because these aren't kangaroo courts; uh, these are courts of law, and law is the thing that they follow. You know, and one of the things um, I, I don't know if this question is also asking what is the power of the ICC to apprehend these people? And the ICC is no power to do that. But 
Once they issue an international indictment, Interpol will ordinarily then issue an international red notice, which is like an, an international arrest warrant that goes to every country. And as David said, if uh, Mr. Putin tries to go to the G7 or make a visit to another country, that country is obligated if they are a party to the ICC, and there are 123 countries that are party, to turn them over to the International Criminal Court. So Europe is going to be completely off bounds for Mr. Putin once there's an indictment. Eric, do you want to go for another question? I understand that aggressive war is a war crime. Is that correct? If correct, does it make it simple to indict and convict Putin since there was no provocation for his invasion? Valerie, do you want to um, give us a definition of the war of aggression as a crime and uh, explain um, what it would take to uh, prosecute somebody like Putin for that? Sure. So the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court has a definition of the crime of aggression, which is different than a war crime, although it can be composed of a number of war crimes um, as aggression is being carried out. But the definition is the invasion or attack by the armed forces of a state on the territory of another state. And also, if the action of a state in allowing its territory, which is placed at the disposal of another state, is used by that other state to perpetrate an act of aggression against a third state. So this definition of aggression is important not only for Russia, but also for Belarus, which gave its, its uh, territory to Russia to use in order to invade um, Ukraine. And the crime of aggression can be tried in certain circumstances before the ICC, but not in this circumstance. And that's because the definition of the jurisdiction for the crime of aggression requires that the country that is committing the aggression needs to have uh, joined the Rome, Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. And Russia is not a party to the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. And then the other way that aggression can come before the ICC is if the UN Security Council refers it. We know that Russia has a veto. It's, it's willing to exercise that veto and therefore aggression can't come before the ICC in that way. And that's why we were talking about this parallel UN General Assembly created court for that particular crime. Eric, do you have another question? What do we as legal professionals otherwise do? What communities or organizations should we connect with and how can we make a difference? Dave, you've thought a lot about this. Well, I have, and I think we all have. And you know, it's, it's important that we really do sh show, you know, the legal profession is the cornerstone internationally and domestically that, that democracy and republics thrive. And so as, as members of our profession, we have to show that uh, the law is just that. And regardless of what we do, it doesn't have to be prosecuting at the international level, but just showing your communities, uh, your state, uh, the federal governments, uh, that the rule of law is important, that it should be uh, honored, uh, the law should be followed. Uh, it's a terrible society that if we, if we do not follow the rule of law. So that, you know, lawyers need to show uh, at whatever level they are doing that uh, the law is important and practice law well, ethically, bring pride to our profession. Uh, but these are, uh, appear to be things that may not make a difference, but in reality, all of us doing what we're already doing uh, does make a difference. I know that's a bit philosophical and maybe trite in some places, but I truly believe that. I think also when we see um, commentators on certain news stations uh, denying that any of this happened, um, taking the alternate reality that Putin has been uh, proselytizing and, and making that available to the American public as if it's true. Um, you know, we who know more about it and, and those of you who are out there listening to this, you should, you should speak up and, and say, no, these uh, are war crimes and these people are guilty um, and should be brought to justice rather than accepting Putin's alternate reality. What were you going to say, Valerie? I was just going to say a version of that, which is that all of us as lawyers can explain to those who are not lawyers what a war crime is, what crimes against humanity are, what genocide is, what aggression is, and getting that information out there correctly 
and um, in a way that is accessible can really help with the political will to support the accountability mechanisms that we're talking about. Eric, it looks like we have time for a couple more questions. Could an indictment or dismissal of the indictment against Putin be theoretically used as a bargaining chip to get Russia to withdraw from Ukraine? You know, I think that's sort of another way of asking the question that I asked earlier. But Dave, do you want to respond to that? You know, uh, it's a peace versus justice, justice versus peace argument in a lot of ways. The bottom line is, is that if we have an appropriate indictment that we shouldn't use it for anything other than holding those, and it's not just Putin, but all those who bear the greatest responsibility for these crimes accountable. And so uh, uh, we should not use indictment as a bargaining chip. Uh, that's, that's a very terrible road to go down uh, because then uh, what it is is that heads of state can bargain themselves out of a, out of a situation where they are criminally liable uh, uh, by throwing out, well, uh, if, if you drop the indictment, then I'll pull out of Ukraine. Uh, that's, not, that's not the road you want to go down. One last question, Eric. Do these type of criminal, criminal cases proceed like other ones where you first get lower individuals indicted to talk against their superiors? <laughs> who then talk against their superiors, et cetera. You know, sometimes they do. Sometimes there will be people who um, will testify against their superiors. Sometimes it's um, tape recordings of like what we've heard, intercepted communications of lower level people that can be used against the superiors. But I think what Valerie and David described as the theories of liability for commanders is such that you can actually prosecute effectively uh, based on evidence of where a commander is, has authority. What, is, or is there a commander who is in charge of, of the bombing of Mariupol? And, and that would be sufficient. Then you show what happened in the bombing of Mariupol. Um, but then how do you go up the next level, uh, David or Valerie, to the commander's boss and, and the boss of that person before you get to Putin? Well, you know, I did use the inner circle of Charles Taylor against him. Uh, I did look the other way. I call it dancing with the devil. Uh, sometimes you do have to uh, take people who are war criminals and use them to prove your case against a higher level individual, such as a pres sitting president of a country. Uh, we did have them come in and testify against Charles Taylor. And I'm, uh, I would assume that that is always an option for uh, the future prosecutors that are going to take on Putin, uh, there are going to be people within his inner circle who are willing to testify either for, for not being charged or for a lesser charge. Uh, this is just standard prosecutorial practice. It's not unethical. It's appropriate. Uh, but in order to seek justice for the people of our victims of atrocity, you know, sometimes you do have to dance with the devil in order to get an ultimate just outcome. Now, speaking of dancing with the devil, I saw one other question here that I was intrigued on. So we'll end on this note. The question was, what would Putin do as a defense if he was tried? And I, I at the risk of shamelessly uh, promoting a book that I wrote several years ago, I have this book here called Enemy of the State. It's about the trial of Saddam Hussein. And if you all remember your history, uh, Saddam Hussein totally wrecked his trial. He, he um, his whole uh, technique, his strategy was not to try to win at the trial level, but to try to hijack the trial and make it just a, a propaganda um, event and to um, embarrass the international community and to try to you know, embolden his supporters. And I have no doubt that that is the strategy that President Putin would probably take here. International trials of people like President Putin, Charles Taylor, Slobodan Milosevic, they're very messy for that reason. And the um, international community, these judges have gotten pretty good at learning how to maintain control of the courtroom over the years. And so, you know, it would certainly be the trial of the century. And it would be something that um, would be broadcast and you'd see it on court TV and on the national news in the evenings. Um, and hopefully, because the judges would have control of the courtroom and um, that the people would be educated about international justice and it wouldn't just be like a, a complete travesty. Dave or uh, Valerie, any last thoughts on that before we close up? No, I fully agree with you, Michael, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to chat with your listeners today. 
Valerie? I would only add that I think that the fact that we have so many international and domestic and regional justice mechanisms going on, that that might actually just build the case for itself. If we have the, the Ukraine um, court system, you know, going through the cases of those who are detained in Ukraine, that could actually help build the case that the International Criminal Court could bring against President Putin. All right, well, we are out of time. I want to thank Milena Stereo, who's out there in Bangladesh, for joining us at the beginning of this. Um, Valerie Osterveld from Canada, David Crane, who's down in North Carolina. What a fantastic panel. I hope everybody enjoyed it as much as I did. Thank you all for tuning in with us. Uh, Case Western Reserve is very pleased to do these kinds of webinars.